Hello, everyone. This is Doug. This is going to be an episode about an incident between James and Paul that's about 23 years after Paul had his Road to Damascus experience. So Paul's been involved with Christianity for some time. 14 years ago, he said he went to Arabia and was, there's no report of what he did there. And then he came back and then the Jerusalem conference happened. So he, he actually hasn't had a lot of time. So subtract 14 from 23, he's had about, oh, nine years. Uh, but anyway, that's enough time that he's written many epistles, Galatians, Corinthians, Ephesians, so on. So in the book of Acts, chapter 21, verse 21, James uses the word apostasy in Greek. It's usually not translated, so you can see that. It's translated as the word forsake, but it isn't. It's for it's apostasy, and I'm going to show you that in a second. So here's the issue we're going to talk about. It's going to be an episode about apostasy. What did that, why did James say this word? What did James mean in Acts 21 asking Paul about the charge that Paul was teaching apostasy against Moses? Those are his words. Now, I'll just tell you real brief, the word apostasy means to turn people away from the law given Moses by Yahweh. Okay. Here is the actual passage in Greek. The, with interlinear English from Mount C's reverse interlinear. You can get this at BibleGateway.com, Acts 21, 21. So I've highlighted it there. I don't know if you can see the word, so I'm going to actually uh, make it big here. See, that is the word forsake. You can see the word apostasy. So now that arrow, keep that arrow in mind. So James tells Paul, but they were told about you, meaning the elders, the apostles, about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to apostatize against Moses. So just so you know, when that apo means uh, over, against or away from, so that is away from Moses. So you always have to have an, uh, a noun subsequent to indicate what it, you are away from. So this is a word that is common in Greek, but when used in conjunction with the intent it's about Moses, you say apostasia Moses. All right. Telling them not to circumcise their children and not to walk according to our customs and you can just read the book of Romans chapter seven, and you see he's saying that uh, the Jews themselves are now freed from their husband. They are now free to marry another, and they were, therefore there's a kartarge, a destruction of the law between them. The severance between the husband and the wife is by the death of the husband, uh, which is hard to explain what he meant by that, but the, the death of the husband of the, uh, the people of Israel frees them now to join onto another who has no law for them. And that's why a lot of people think that the law is gone because of, of that passage in Romans 7, as to Jews too. And Paul also saying, says in Galatians, there's no more Jew or Gentile. So he did get rid of circumcision because if there's no more Jew, there's no more sons of Israel. There is no more basis for having any more Abrahamic covenant for, for that purpose. All right. So uh, let's continue. Now, before I show you the words and the law and, and the provisions that deal with the issue of apostasy, let me just show you examples of apostasy, that, apostasy so you'll see it's important, it's relevant. Look on the right side, Yahweh on the law. How long is the law to exist? It's eternal for all generations. It's repeated 11 times. You see all those verses there? Exodus 27, 21. Please go look it up if you don't agree with me, if you think I'm wrong. Go look up Exodus 30, verse 21. Go look up Leviticus 6, verse 18. Go look up Leviticus 7, verse 36. Go look up Leviticus 10, 9. I can go on and on. And actually, I, I, I have somewhere else, there's over 21 <laughs> times this happens. Everlasting is another way. Everlasting for all generations or eternal for all generations, but basically identical synonymous terms. So that's 11 I've given you there. There's another 10 floating around. And I, I have that in another database. The point is this, can a, a law eternal for all generations be discarded because it's a tutor by besides somebody just saying, I've, I, I've been to the third heaven. I'm talking to, uh, I can't repeat anything I'm told. Uh, this is in uh, Second Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 3 to 6. I, it's, illicit, Ill, uh, it's illicit for me to tell you, and it's incomprehensible what I'm hearing, but I'm hearing things that third heaven tells me that these provisions about this whole thing, eternal for all generations, this wasn't even given by God. But let's just look at what he says in one part of, of Galatians 3.24. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under schoolmaster. Could be more clear. That schoolmaster that was eternal for all generations is now gone. This is apostasy 101. Okay? And then you can say, how did it end up in the law? Because the Gentiles took over the church and they're apostates themselves and they wanted to move the day of the Shabbat to Sunday. This all happened in the 300s under Constantine. This is when we were corrupted. This is when the Roman Catholic Church was born. 
And then subsequently in the Council of Hippo around 393, they confirmed the books that you see now, apparently, uh, that there's, they confirmed, all I can say is no record exists of anything that happened at Hippo, by the way, every record was destroyed. But the Council of Hippos allegedly when the first uh, council decision was of what was canon, okay, in 393 AD. And so that means you're dealing with a church, how far removed from the original church and, and uh, 300 years plus. So w there had to have been a canon before this time, but you're supposed to believe, no, it didn't happen until 393. There was a certain absolute, what there was an absolute canon and it was just the words of Jesus. Okay. That was the early church canon. And I have an article on that. We're going to do a video. We're doing a video series that's going to show that to you and even the scholars agree so it's not even a dispute when you just isolate the early period up to 180 that's it jesus was the only thing that was on the same level as the law and prophets and anything that was a letter or writing was not considered uh material that you would treat as inspired it's just a myth and it was a myth born of also mistranslation of uh to timothy 1 timothy 3 16 that uh, all scripture is inspired of god it doesn't say that it says all scripture inspired of god is useful for edification it was changed by adding a word is in there in italics and the king james and everybody got this idea oh all there's this magic word called scripture now that we've created that that now we have this bible because we've created a, our own definition of scripture is always inspired if we can just use that word but in greek it was just simply the word graphe meaning writing all writings inspired of god are useful for edification that's all it originally said anyway getting back to this so you got apostasy here because you have a clear statement of god unequivocal it's eternal for all generations and then on the left you have paul saying wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come we are no longer under schoolmaster and then in galatians 3 19 when you look a little bit earlier he says the law was given by angels through a mediator and so far you don't know just reading that is that going to be a bad thing yes it's a very bad thing uh, this, by the way, comes from the Book of Jubilees, an apocryphal work that said, yes, the law was given by angels. And then it identifies these other angels that are inferior, which are the angels that control the elements of wind, water and fire. Well, guess what? Paul says in Galatians 4, 9, that the 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 uh, why do you he tells the Galatians who want to do Shabbat? Why do you uh, want to be in bondage again to the weak and beggarly? And it's translated in England to the King James as elements but it means elemental celestial beings, according to Vincent, I'm not making it up, based on when he, he's saying, if you look at the Book of Jubilees, that apocryphal work by a, a Pharisee in 150 BC, that created this impression that God, Yahweh, didn't even give the law. And that was, by the way, to build up that there's such a thing as an oral law, because if you have a written law that really didn't come from God, Yahweh, the Pharisees were saying, well, we've received and have the, rep the re reservoir, what's the oral law that was give given directly by Yahweh. So they made their story more authoritative but that's all going on here in galatians and that is straight apostasy right out of the playbook for an apostasy anybody who would teach this who would be sentenced to death uh under the law of the laws of israel under the De deuteronomic law of De deuteronomy 13 1 to 10. okay i want to show you another place in the bible where you can see this uh, contrast uh but this time it's just simply how god is treats apostasy and how he describes this. this is in the book of isaiah and by the way paul quotes the, the book of isaiah many times so he believes it's authoritative doesn't he so take a look at what's on the left king james version 1611 in the jewish publication society in 1917 are identical to the law the torah and to the testimony that is the ten commandments if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them then i just want to show you what the esv has it says to the teaching, that is the law, the Torah, so that, that's not a good change to get rid of the Torah, that you can't see it anymore, but it's to the law and to the testimony. Now, the testimony is defined in the law itself as the Ten Commandments. So to the law and to the Ten Commandments, they will not speak according to this word. It is because they have no dawn. And that's not really a good definition. I went and researched it, and this is what it really says. When it says there's no light in them, it is, it does say no dawn, but then you have to know what this exact meaning of the word dawn, it meant they do not have even a sliver of light in them as darkness pervades them just as the sky is dark before the dawn. So it's this absolutely darkest end of the night before any sliver of light starts breaking forth. That is the deepest, darkest part of the night. That is what God is saying. They are, they are part of the, the moment before dawn <laughs> that, that there's the deepest darkness. And that is the point in which these people are. So anybody who teaches you 
if, if they will not speak according to this word, the Torah and the Ten Commandments, the testimony, they have the they're in the deepest, darkest place in the universe, the dark, deepest darkness place in our planetary system. OK, so that tells you for a fact, God does not like apostasy, does not like people teaching against his Torah eternal for all generations. So I want you to get the feeling of God's heart on apostasy. I want you to get the feeling of what an example of it was. Now I'm going to show you what apostasy is from the normative Protestant perspective, and I'm going to pick actually a Reformed Presbyterian theologian. That's where I spent many years in the Presbyterian Church, Reformed. And this was a major person of Reformed theology, and he actually wrote a book called Systematic Theology in 1871. I picked up this book off of books.google.com. You can find it there too. Go to page 763, Charles Hodge, Systematic Theology. And this is what he says. If the apostles taught anything contrary to the authenticated revelation of God, they were to be rejected. What are you talking about? You're talking about what I'm telling you, apostasy. You, you say anything inconsistent. Now, I'm not going to tell you he took this test here and supplied these words here. I think a lot of Christians never go back and actually read the law. They don't want to test Paul. They don't want to research. But I can tell you now with modern skills, you can just type in the words. I said, type in the words eternal for all generations or type in everlasting for all generations. And guess what you get? You're going to get more than these 11. You're going to get 21. So, and maybe he didn't think, the, maybe he thought the law was a, a tutor. Maybe he just accepts somebody's statement and uncritically accepted something and he doesn't know how to research. And it's 1871, what, 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 1871, yes. So he doesn't know, he doesn't have the tools we have today. So I think God's made this a provisional time that Christians can now finally test things in a very fair, neutral manner. This is not even a, it's a question of words. It's like, are these words on the right, Yahweh and the law to turn for our generation, are they contradicted by the words on the left? Yes, you can't make, you can't make up an excuse. It's just simply they're contradictory. Ergo, it's apostles. It's the apostle Paul taught contrary to the authenticated revelation of God. There are to be rejected. Is it possible that the law of Moses could have been con contradicted, excuse me, modified over 11 times, maybe 20 times fraudulently to stop Paul in the future? No, this is God's statement. It And it's all for all generations. So let's look at another Protestant source, very mainstream, Norman Geisler in his uh, encyclopedia called Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics by Norman Giesler, 1999. So you can get this uh, for reasonable cost at Kindle. And here's what he says. He's talking about uh, the, the rule of apostasy, but he never tells you the word apostasy is what he's talking about. He just tells you the principle of whatever came last has to be protested by what came before. But anyway, it's still valid. One such test was the authenticity of a book. That is, does the book tell the truth about God and his world as known from previous revelations? God cannot contradict himself. Second Corinthians 1, 17 to 18. So Paul even has the understanding that if you say something today that is contradictory of before, it can't be from God. So that means that Paul would be welcoming that you test him by the words that came before him nor can he utter what is false, Hebrews 6, verse 18. So if Paul, uh, even Hebrews says, if Paul contradicts anything that is from Yahweh, like over here, this is completely contradictory of Yahweh, right? You are free to now say that person should be rejected. That's what he's going to tell you. No book with false claims can be the word of God, clearly, unequivocally. Now you're going to say, well, why is it? People say to me, it's in the word of God, so it must be true. No, that's not how you determine something that God... God's going to explain to you in a minute why he allows false prophets. He literally says, I allow them. So he's not going to exclude them. I allow them. He tells you it's to prove you, to see, to test you, see if you love me with your whole heart, mind, and soul. So I'm going to read you that in a second. It's in this very passage of Deuteronomy. Moses stated the principle about prophets generally that, quote, now he only does 13, 1 to 3, and, and he doesn't even include all of verse 3. So I'm going to go show you that after quoting this. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true, concerning which is spoken of you to you, saying, let us go after other gods whom you've not known, such as a God who has no food laws, a God who allows you to eat meat, sacrifice, titles, stuff like that, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Now let's keep going because he didn't include everything. So take a look here. He stopped here, dreamer of dreams, and look where dreamer of dreams is, and then he did not include the rest of the sentence. And I think it's very important because this is what tells you why God does this. Why does God allow it to happen right in the books that you're reading? He tells you why. He allows it to happen. 
For the Lord Yahweh, your God, proves you, tests you, to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Pause. So you see, testing Paul, like the Bereans did, and we'll get into that in uh, Acts 17, Luke commends them for testing Paul every day to see whether what he said was true as against the prior revelations. See, that was a good thing. And what does that do? That's a good soul searching thing where you're you're willing, God, I'm going to not follow this person. If you tell me he's contradictory to you, oh, God, I'm going to prove to you I love you with all my heart, mind and soul. I'm going to do a test. That would be the right response. I get a lot of people saying, I don't want that. I don't want to hear anything about Paul being wrong. And 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 we did it. We made the decision back in Hippo in 393 AD and we're all stuck with this and it's just the way it is. Never mind. It was clearly not the uh, canon before that time. The canon was not formed in, in, with all those books early on. And we can prove that the early scholars all agree it was just the words of Jesus. OK, nothing more. And the letters were all considered not secondary stuff, nothing of the the same level of, of what the law and prophets were. And Jesus was put in the same category as the law and prophets. Anyway, I'm digressing. Sorry. Verse four, you shall walk after the Lord, your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and cleave unto him. So in other words, the way you, te- you prove you love God is you go back to his commandments and you follow them. And, oh, I don't like to do the commandments, Doug. Oh, you're such a legalist. No, 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 no. The Pharisees, this is a real myth. The Pharisees are not only Paul says they kept the law well. But if you read the Dead Sea Scrolls and you read Jesus, they, he says they relax about the law. Just read Matthew 23, verse 23. You, you're good about teaching, tithing, but you neglect the what? Waiter matters of the law. What are those? Mercy. Oh, what's mercy? Mercy is in Exodus 20, verse 6. Oh, what is? how do I get saved under the Ten Commandments? Oh, it says God says you, I extend mercy to those who love me and obey my commandments. Oh, my gosh. So see, that's why it says here, keep his commandments. This is how you get mercy. This is how you stay right right with God. And, and so, oh, we're saving ourselves is what people keep coming back to me. Hey, I didn't make up these rules. That's the bottom line. If you want to insult God's word, you'd go ahead and do it. I don't I don't say I'm earning it. I'm saying I'm doing what he said me said for me to do. And if you if you want to do that, fine, you can you can go to hell believing that uh, these words should be disregarded in favor of just saying this is wrong. We we can't save ourselves. We can't do anything right. We're just so evil. And that, by the way, is completely contrary to God's word as well, that, that we can do nothing right. I mean, Job was a righteous man. So Noah was a person who was, uh, I think it actually says he never sinned. <laughs> Noah never sinned. And then you've got uh, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. She was a righteous woman, and so was her husband. And so, I, I mean, there's so many proof, disproofs of Paul. It's just ridiculous. And Paul quotes out of context. But I digress again. I'm sorry. Anyway, that's the whole thing. Right, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. So if Paul does this, contradicts the eternal generations, says it's a tutor for temporary time, it's gone. He's he if he were alive today, you would be mandated by God to kill him because he's a false prophet. He's contradicting the words of God. And by the way, he actually, the funny thing is he never quotes God Yahweh. So I actually should say this to you. One of the other elements usually is you have to prove the person actually quotes Yahweh. Paul never quotes Yahweh. He never even quotes Jesus, giving him a prophetic message for us. Okay. So we, the only quote he has of Jesus talking to him is in 2 Corinthians 12 or 7, where his Jesus refuses to release him from the, the torment of an angel of Satan, which is very problematical for that, that Jesus to be really our Jesus. Our Jesus would have released him from a torment of an angel of Satan, wouldn't you think? But anyway, that's that's the only time he quotes Jesus. But the the way you to prove a false prophet, he has to take the risk. He has to say, Yahweh told me this or, or uh, Jesus told me that. And if he doesn't do that, he doesn't qualify to try to be a prophet of God. OK, now we're going to come up to the point where you're going to hear about the turning away. This is going to be the word apostasy in Greek when it gets translated. Verse five. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from Yahweh. So apostasy from Yahweh is what's happening when you have a false prophet. And and Moses was the embodiment of his uh, commands in the Torah. So it's also called the apostasia Moses from Moses. Your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust you out of the way. So this person is thrusting you out of the way, which the Lord thy God commanded you. So this also is understood to be another meaning of apostasy. So you're being pushed, pushed with force 
out of the right way to, into the wrong way. Remember, Jesus called the way. Well, that means he's the right way. And then there's the wrong way. And the wrong way can be apostasy by someone who says and gives you this. Uh, uh, I, I hate to use this analogy at the moment, but wolf in sheep's clothing, they're going to tell you all these good things that you agree with. You know, love is kind, love is virtuous, love is patient, all these nice things. But what their wolf aspect is what? It's this stuff. This is the wolf stuff. <laughs> the idea that the law of Turner for all generations goes away, the tutor under Paul's direction with no quotation from Yahweh. Do you see the difference? So what Paul's done here very carefully, just so you know, he probably has avoided being killed under the apostasy law by not quoting Yahweh. And you're going to say, where does that rule come from? You go, go look at Jeremiah 35. So the Rechabites uh, are commended by God for disobeying the prophet Jeremiah because he said to them, uh, eat, uh, excuse me, drink wine. And the Rechabites' uh, forefather had said, no, no more my heir should ever have any wine and don't drink it. And they disobeyed Jeremiah and God Yahweh commended them and said, for this deed they did of rejecting my prophet Jeremiah and not listening to him, when he doesn't quote me, I'm going to commend them forever. And I'm going to have a Rechabite at, by my side on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the chair with my throne in heaven. Okay, that's how important it is to God that you know that he is quoted. Now, the only exception is for Jesus, by the way, because what did happen there is Yahweh speaks from heaven, quotes the Deuteronomy 18 passage about the prophet of Deuteronomy 18, and he's going to, every word he speaks will be from Yahweh. So he doesn't have to do it once he gets this confirmation from heaven in front of multiple witnesses, Peter, James, and John. And it means you've got a, a, a person who God, Yahweh, has personally sealed from heaven above just like he did with Moses, because he appeared above Moses and, and came down and his voice was heard thundering and that gave him confirmation. This same thing that happened with Jesus as the prophet in the, the transfiguration account. Anyway, I digress. Let's keep on this uh, topic here when I finish up here. So uh, let's see what else. Oh, so then he had one last sentence. So any teaching about God, Geisler did, contrary to what his people already knew to be true was to be rejected. Now, the funny thing is he never used the word apostasy. So you, as a Christian, if you were even a barely aware, see, this is hidden from you, the word apostasy, it's covered up with the word forsake. If you ever came alert that the word apostasy was there, you then wonder, well, what's the law of that? Can I look that up? And if you looked it up in his book and you did a word search inside of the text thing, you won't find any word of apostasy, okay? It's just, uh, or at least it doesn't lead you here. I remember that I did this research and it did not lead me here. I had to kind of dig around. So- the problem is they don't want you to know the law of apostasy, but he did have to tell you something. The, the, this actually was the more blunt. Mr. Hodge, the reformed pastor, good man, good reformed guy, he got he hits it on the head. If the apostles thought anything contrary to the authenticated revelation of God, they were to be rejected. And now you have absolute proof this is true. Exit him over here. Absolute. Now, I could go through many, many other examples. You all know what they are. You know, the Shabbat's gone. You know, I mean, just over and over, just apostasy. And he makes it, in Romans 7, he makes it also applicable to Jews, that, you know, your law is also gone. It was, a, a, you know, while well, you were married to Yahweh, but now he's dead. I don't you know, don't ask me why he says this, but your the husband has died. Your husband has died. You're now free to marry another, Jesus, and so on and so forth. So that's in Romans 7. So, and he uses the word katarge, which means destroy. This this uh, covenant bond between you and, and your, your husband died when he died, and therefore when your husband died, now you people of Israel are free to marry somebody else. And that's Jesus. And I, you know, I could tell you how pagan that is, but I'm not going to digress at this moment. But just think about it yourself. That's just another crazy apostate statement. Now, does Luke commend as virtuous and noble the Bereans testing whether Paul was consistent with prior holy writings? So in other words, did he show us people who were following the rules to determine apostasy or not? Let's read this in Acts 17, verses 10 to 12, NIV in Berea. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. So by the way, I'm going to show you in a second what Paul taught in the book of Acts. Very normative, very pro-Jesus, very consistent with Jesus. So we're going to look at that in a second. So there's no reason at this point that the Bereans would have any be on guard to anything because Paul Paul is teaching in Luke's presence very normative statements. I'll show that to you in a second. Uh, what's important here is notice that the Berean Jews are more noble doing what 
is so they're supposed to do, which is check if Paul is consistent with the scripture that came before him. And they did this every day. So this is something you could do every morning, get up and make an exercise to prove that you are being diligent towards God's word, that you test everything that Paul says. He says many things that are good. You know, love is kind, love is wonderful. Yes, he does that. That's But remember, Jesus warned us about wolves and sheep's clothing. What would you expect? Sheep's clothing means they're going to have nice words, verses like, you know, love is kind, love is wonderful. But what is the wolf part of it? This is the wolf. Here's the wolf right here. This is apostasy, okay? All right, so that's the, this is a test for you. You you have to go through it. I'm just showing you how I would recommend you do it, but you can do it your own way and however you think. But it basically, you have to try, try to compare what Paul says against what the law and the prophets have said before Paul. And I would now add Jesus. I think Jesus is the prophet, right? So that means he's a higher level than anybody. And that means Paul has to conform to Jesus' words, not Jesus has to conform to Paul's words. Now, uh, some people uh, started to uh, respond to my videos and said, I'm trying to be a legalist or something. No, I'm just saying, here's what God's word says. Legalism should be people who are excessively putting on you obligations under the law. I'm not doing that. <laughs> uh, in fact, people don't like that. I point out I, what Isaiah 56, six to seven says. So you'll see, uh, this is the message of salvation that Paul should have told you about, but he didn't. But Jesus cites and quotes right out of this passage I'm reading to you. So Jesus knew about it, but Paul somehow didn't get the message. Also, the sons of the stranger, that's Ger, meaning Gentiles, that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and take holds of my covenant. And according to Friedman in his commentary on Torah, that means the Ten, Com Ten Commandments. And he points out the Ark of the Covenant was a place where the covenant was kept, meaning the two tablets of stone that had the Ten Commandments. So that's what he says. So I'm not an expert in the Torah, but that's what an expert in the Torah said in his book the commentary on Torah. He's the top expert today in amongst Judaism. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain. I'll tell you what that is in a second and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their born to offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. That doesn't mean there's going to be animal sacrifices in, in heaven. You'll see it's there as burnt grain. There are burnt grain offerings such as Leviticus 2, 9. There's others, other examples for mine house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. That's what Jesus quotes. So, um, Jesus knew of this passage, obviously. Paul didn't. That's a material problem for Christians who don't know that you need to keep Shabbat. If you don't keep Shabbat, you're not going to be what? I will bring to my holy mountain. Now, if you doubt what holy mountain means, I, I don't want to put this in this video. So do the research yourself. It's Isaiah 11. Uh, Yahweh is speaking to Isaiah and he tells him, in my holy mountain, there will be no more hurt or pain. The, the animals, the, the, the wolf will sit next to the lamb and all this stuff. It's the it's some scholars who are Protestants say this is the new millennium. Others just say it's heaven, whatever. It's it's salvation, okay? Your salvation is to get into this holy mountain. That's what God is saying. And if you want to go there, you've got to keep the Sabbath and you have to hold fast to the Ten Commandments. Now, I believe since the prophet came, God said, I'm going to hold all man accountable to him. So under Deuteronomy 18 principles, you have to now add Jesus's commands that are clearly in the sense of the same level of morality as the Ten Commandments. So if he says uh, you have to give charity to the brothers and sisters, uh, food, water, and clothing, and if you don't, even though you call me Lord, Lord, I'm going to send you the same place as the devil and his angels, I would say that's a command to do charity to your brothers and sisters, even though that's not in the Ten Commandments. Okay? So Jesus can, as the prophet, can do these kind of things. That's the whole point. God, so, And there's nothing inconsistent with Torah. Why? Because God already told us in Torah and Deuteronomy 18 that this, I'm going to send a special prophet and everything he says, I'm going to hold all people accountable to listen to him. See how God perfectly fits everything together. And uh, I just want to tell you, um, uh, when we get back now to the issue of Paul and the apostasy in Acts 21, is definitely what Paul is being confronted with is a claim that he's guilty of apostasy of Moses. This is the rumor that the apostles had heard, and they now want him to prove he isn't. So just to show you something is you tell me in your own heart, is Paul being straight with them? Now, at the time of Acts 21 is down here, Blue Letter Bible, 57 AD. Let's take a look at all the, uh, this is the expert opinion. Uh, this is summarized at Wikipedia, the expert opinion of when Paul's epistles were written. So anything that overlaps 57 AD, let's see what that is. So Galatians, he wrote Galatians. That's 48 AD. He wrote First Thessalonians as early as 49 AD up to 51. That's, that's written before 
Acts 21. 1 Corinthians 53 to 54, 55 to 66, second. Romans 55 to 57, all those dates come within that. Philippians 57 AD comes within it. Philemon comes within that. It's still there. Second Thessalonians 51, Colossians 57. The only one that falls out of it is technically Ephesians, but I, I happen to believe it's earlier, but that's regard, regardless. Uh, then the others are not there. So the only ones that fall out, according to the experts here, the, the Pauline epistles, is Ephesians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So everything else he's written, his entire corpus, essentially, except uh, I would say Ephesians is a major work. That is not uh, agreed there. But I think it was there, but that's that's a, my dispute. So this is what you have to measure him against. This is everything he said. Is he acting honest with James in Acts 21, 21? given what you know he's written in all those works. Is he being straight? He says, so uh, James says, uh, they're informed of you that you teach all the Jews, which are among the Gentiles to forsake, apostatize against Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. And indeed, he says in Romans 7, the Jews are freed from the law. It was uh, what the husband died and now they're released from the law. Verse 22, what is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that you are come. Do therefore that this, what we say to you. He's commanding him. And by the way, that shows you he's superior to Paul. At least that's in his position as bishop, right? We have four men which have a vow to them. Take them, take and purify yourself with them and be at charges with them. So pay their way. There's a fee involved that they may shave their heads. It's a part of the Nazarite vow. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou uh, thyself also walk orderly and keep the law. He does exactly what he's told. He says nothing that he believed the law was given by angels. It was a tutor. All the things that you believe and rely upon, he doesn't even have the courage or the guts to say anything to James. He knows he's wrong. Paul also knows that if he told the truth, that James could ask the Sanhedrin to execute uh, Paul. He could then get permission. The Sanhedrin could get permission from Rome to kill Paul, even though he has a right not to be executed. Uh, even Rome might say, uh, wait a minute, you've gone against the law of that country. They're, you're an apostate. Yeah, we might make an exception for that. So he's he's basically just com committing deception. And, I, you know, you decide if you think I'm wrong. You think he's why does he follow through and do this when you, you know he doesn't teach any of these things and he should not be giving the confirmation that he keeps the law. A law, he says, a tutor is dead and gone. Come on. So this is a real telltale sign that we're dealing with someone who does not have the same level of integrity of our Lord Jesus. And I want to share with you, people said, oh, you're going to throw out all of Paul's writings. And so that's that's going to be bad. Right. But you know what? I say, leave them in there. Uh, I, I, I have one. I think the Thessalonians where Paul says uh, the Jews are the enemies of all mankind. I think we need to act, have a big uh, come to Jesus moment. Eight million people were killed who the banner call of the Nazi party was to use that verse and Luther to destroy 8 million people, at least get the people prepared to do that in subterranean uh, ovens and, and hiding. Anyway, what I was trying to say to the person is uh, people can be saved with Paul in the Bible as long as they follow the Paul of Acts. And so listen to this. Paul's doctrines in Acts are 100% aligned, aligned with Jesus. Number one, for Paul under oath in front of Luke told King Agrippa that this was Paul's gospel to the Gentiles. Acts 26, verses 19 to 20. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Acts 26, 19 to 20, KJV. Number two, I said, likewise, no Christian who follows Paul's words in Acts 24, verse 14 can be lost. Quote, I believe in all things that are that are according to the law and prophets. So sure, leave Paul in there, but let people test him and then see him and, and show them how to test him. And then they won't make a mistake and believe what you read in the epistles, because this is what he's this is what he's willing to represent to, to Luke. Luke has no idea Paul is an apostate, none whatsoever. This is totally pro law, right? OK, and we've already dealt with number three here, which is Paul led and misled uh, Bishop James of Jerusalem to believe that he was what? Keeping the law. That's exactly what he was told to prove by do taking of this vow. And he doesn't even believe the law applies anymore. It was given by angels through mediator, Moses, and the weak and beggarly celestial beings, all these things. And it's a tutor. He doesn't tell him any of that. He's misleading James. And Luke is watching all this. He's a witness to this. This is where he's actually present. 
and Luke, Paul is willing to deceive Luke. That's really what's amazing here, my friends. So if you disagree, you have to prove to me that Colossians 2, 4, and everybody, <laughs> that Colossians 2, 14 doesn't say what it says. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, Colossians 2, 14 to 17. Do you realize he took away the Sabbath that in Isaiah 56, verses 6 to 7, a passage that Jesus himself quoted from just a little bit later, he took away the one key, one of the top 10 keys they had to have, which is to obey Sabbath. This man was not the apostle to the Gentiles. He was the enemy of the Gentiles. Maybe he didn't know he was, but. Anybody who follows him is fall going into a pit of hell. That's what it really means, my friends. Pit of hell. If you observe only Sunday and you don't do Shabbat, you have to rest on Saturday. And you could do both if you want. And uh, by the way, look at this. Uh, who agrees with the, me? Martin Luther, uh, for Paul in Colossians 2.16, abolished the Sabbath to show us that the Sabbath was given to the Jews alone. No, it wasn't. It was to us in, Gen in Isaiah 56. Hey, guess what? 6 to 7 says that has that's a key for us to go to heaven, Luther. You'll have to explain away this uh, passage if you want to keep him in the Bible, uh, the, the authentic Bible, and convince people he should still be followed. He says here in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 6 to 17, the letter kills. If, if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones, obviously the Ten Commandments was glorious, so on. It was to be done away with. I'm kind of skipping a few things here. He calls it administration of condemnation. He, then he gets into more specifics here. For if that which is done away was glorious, so he's clearly talking about the Ten Commandments, much more than which remains is glorious. Seeing then, and by the way, one of the Ten Commandments, Sabbath, got, and he's getting rid of that, right? He got, he's erasing it. So your apostle from your, your apostle is taking away one of the key components that God Yahweh said in Isaiah 56 for six to seven is necessary for salvation for the Gentile. But I digress. Seeing that which we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses. He's so see, he's now putting Moses down. He can speak plainer than Moses. Now, what did I show you in a concurrent episode is God said, I speak clear and without riddles to Moses, but all the others I speak through vision and dreams. So it's less clear because my Moses is he's he's in head. He's in charge of my house. That's what he said. And, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look at the end of that which is abolished. That which is abolished. This is the American standard, by the way. But their minds were blinded. Oh, they're blind, Paul. Really? For until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ, but e even unto the, this day, this is very sanctimonious discussion. Let me just say that to you. When Moses read, the veil is upon their heart. This is fiction. This is all made up stuff. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He is saying, being without the Ten Commandments, you are you are free. What does Jesus say? The exact opposite. I'm going to repeat it again. John, read John 8, verses 30 to 47. Men who believe in Jesus come to him, say would, they'd like to just meet him. And he says, now you can be free. Become my disciples and you'll be free indeed. They go, we've never been in slavery. We've never been in bondage to anyone. He says, anyone who is sinning, breaking God's law, is in bondage. What is Paul saying? He's not going to help you uh, obey the law. He's going to tell you the law doesn't even exist. You can just ignore it. Which means you're gonna, you you have no barrier to know even know what laws you're disobeying. That's literally his solution to sin. Just get rid of it. He even says that, by the way, in Romans seven. If I had not known and the law said don't covet, I would never have coveted. That's what he says in Romans seven. All right. So there is the Berean testing uh, proposal that uh, Luke gave us, and it's it said you're more noble when you do that. You are basically being more honorable to God when you are testing Paul against and do it every day he said they were doing it every day the Bereans were really more noble and they were doing it every day testing what he said against the words that had come before from the law prophets and maybe even from the true jesus so that's important okay so i i pray that those of you who are not yet committed to christ in the sense that you would abandon paul and follow just jesus i hope and pray this episode may be the turning point for you that you can see it in clear enough terms that there is no way that Paul belongs in your spiritual Bible. That doesn't mean it shouldn't. he shouldn't be there to test others to allow them to experience the same test. But make sure, I think in the future, we need to have a little preface in front of his works that would indicate 
there uh, there is a good basis to believe that God let this happen for a test of us. All right, God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.